started? Uh, I'm Michael Speaks. I'm the one month old dean of the School of Architecture. Uh, thank you all for uh, not going to Jacques Herzog's lecture tonight. You will not be disappointed. I can guarantee you that. Um, we have a terrific lecturer tonight, Angie Coe, whom I'll introduce in a second. But for those who have not uh, seen the poster, um, uh, I'll just go over a few highlights. We have, uh, as you probably know, the first uh, one, two, three, the first half dozen lectures are uh, visiting critics, um, of which Angie Ko is uh, one. Uh, Angie Ko is today 917 Rosalind Shea, uh, also a visiting critic coming from New York. David Rue, who's taught here before, uh, 919. The, the week of 9 uh, 25 will be the AIA, and we'll have actually a couple of really remarkable speakers here that week, uh, including uh, Vishan uh, Chakrabarti, uh, who's, who has an incredible new book uh, just published on cities. The very next night, we'll have Hank Ovi, who's a, I think, a really interesting person. I think you'll enjoy his lecture. He was the director of national spatial planning in Holland uh, for a while, then uh, left that job and came, and now is the um, He's a senior advisor for Secretary uh, of HUD, Donovan, and his, his, his portfolio is all of the post Sandy stuff. He will uh, lecture the next evening. Uh, Brad Lynch, uh, another VC on 10.1, 10.3, Lynn Rice, another VC. Um, uh, David Walker, landscape architect, 10.8. Uh, Kate Orr, if you don't know, is uh, super cool, uh, a great lecturer. Uh, does uh, really one of the hottest landscape firms, certainly in the U.S. and in, in the world right now. Um, was very lucky uh, to have entered a competition that I was a juror on last year, and we gave her the prize. I was very disappointed with that because um, she was supposed to lecture here last year, and it was just as you were deciding on the deans, uh, or in the middle of the dean search. And since I knew she was going to show the project, that I had helped her get. I thought she would mention that project and mention my name favorably so that you would be predisposed to hire me. But, um, but I didn't even need that, so I'm, I'm very happy about that. Um, that was good. Uh, uh, Rodolfo uh, uh, Machado uh, here at 1022, very famous practice out of Cambridge. Dennis Crompton uh, will be here to do a lecture on Archigram and a movie. Uh, he's not filming, he's going to show one. Um, and who else? We have uh, two great book talks uh, faculty members, Lori Brown, uh, 912, and Susan Henderson, 1017. And, well, there's a lot of other good stuff on here. Look at the poster, it's hard to avoid it. It's, um, there's a big one out in the, uh, out in, in the hallways. Um, but that's not, you're not here tonight. Me to read you the poster. We do have a terrific lecture series. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, but I'm here to introduce Angie Ko. Um, and I, if I try to read this, I won't be able to, and I, and I know her anyway. Um, Angie Ko's a visiting critic uh, here this term. She's also coordinating the, um, the New York uh, program right now. Um, Angie uh, has uh, been a faculty member at the University of Kentucky before here. She did some teaching at Columbia. She worked uh, in a variety of offices in New York City, including Bernard Schumi's office, asymptote too. Uh, uh, asymptote uh, as well, Honey Rashid and uh, Lisa and Couture. Um, Angie is a graduate of uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania, which is a computer science undergraduate major. Is that right, close? Um, and a graduate also of Columbia's uh, um, post-professional degree program, or MR? MR. MR program. Um, uh, Angie has been a McDowell Fellow. Uh, she won the Rome Prize and was a Rome Fellow three years ago, two years ago. But some of the things tonight I think she will show likely come out of some of the research that she did there. Um, I also uh, have, was very lucky and have been able to teach a studio with Angie uh, at Kentucky last year, probably the best one I was really ever involved with, kind of remarkable um, thing that we did on uh, Taipei, um, and we will probably do another version of that this year. Anyway, uh, without further ado, help me welcome Angie Coe. Okay, 
can you guys hear me? And let me see. I don't see anything on my screen. Oh, I do now. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction. And um, thank everyone for the warm invitation to be here to lecture um, and to teach. So I'm really excited to share my work. Uh, the title of my lecture is called Rabbit and Pantheon. Um, that part is really about some ideas I've been working through um, more recently and are still, I'm still developing. Um, and I'm going to start the lecture with um, more resolved projects that are in a way completed, though they all tie together. So uh, Rabbit and Pantheon will come a little bit later. Um, so I'm going to start with um, three projects that all deal with um, some interests that I have in topography, uh, topology, and uh, typology. Um, these projects um, deal with, as well, uh, aspects of geometry and form, but always related to program. So the first project is called Kentucky Crossings, um, and this is an RFQ that I won in Lexington, Kentucky for um, an art trail called the Legacy Trail. It's, an, it's about an eight mile trail that links the Kentucky Horse Park to downtown Lexington. And um, this is, it's a small image, but you can see that the trail crosses the road um, in a number of locations. So I was commissioned to design the crossings for, this, for these intersections. Um, and a lot of art um, was also commissioned to be installed along the trail. So this is sort of um, an architectural and infrastructural piece that I did. Uh, this is a little animation that I'll start with. Oops. So the crosswalks, um, I developed a, a tessellation of, a ge of basically this triangular geometry because I wanted them to all be different and unique, um, but there were some constraints in how we were going to build them, and they had to be very graphic, and um, they also really wanted them to have aspects of Kentucky. So what I had done was um, I looked at icons of the state, so the squirrel, which is um, the, the state wild animal, and the viceroy butterfly, which is the state insect, and the cardinal, which is the state bird. And um, I used these graphic motifs um, to develop a, a system of, um, of tessellation where I could put together a number of crosswalks um, in a matrix. So these are the crossings. Um, and part of the idea is that um, while crosswalks are ostensibly for humans to cross the street, um, there's um, a relationship between the graphic organization and this attitude about many ways to cross the street, and perhaps that different creatures or um, animals might have different behaviors when they do. So um, these are the series. And uh, these are some of the locations. The second project um, I'm going to show is was a competition for um, a garden. And um, I did this project that I'm titling uh, Domestic Landscape. And this is a combination of um, furniture and landscape formations. So these are hills. They're very small hills. And there are furniture inside the hills. So um, two things that don't really seem to go together, um, interior um, equipment for the body and large landscape formations um, meet at a strange size. And the posture of the body um, and the posture um, or the, the profile of a landscape formation and when seen from different angles, um, produce these weird combinations of bodies and landscape formations. And I don't know if you recognize one of these wonderful people, Kyle, our very own Kyle Miller, who's here at Syracuse. Um, 
I'm very grateful to him for being my scale figure. So um, these are some of the, this is the garden, and there are a variety of furniture pieces. Uh, we have a prairie bench hill, so the kind of vegetation that goes on, on the hill. Um, a clover twin, twin bed hill, a lawn twin bed hill, a wild mint double chair hill, a meadow recliner and chair hill hill, um, a lavender chase lounge and chair hill, and here are some people enjoying these formations. I think that um, one of the ways of, um, that projects can live, even if they're not built or through the drawings. And for me, I think the drawings are really surprising because there's um, this kind of perfect geometry that looks like a target, um, and it's a, it's a topography map, basically, um, intersected with these um, topographies of the body um, as it's inserted in different elevations in the landscape. So altogether, um, you start to get spaces that might be like rooms between formations. Um, the next project I'm going to show is um, one called Public Facility. And this is actually the first prototype. This is a project that I, I'm, I did and I'm continuing to do with my partner, Jesse Le Cavalier. And this is um, similarly looking at um, combining certain kinds of programs and scales. Uh, but at a very different scale. So this is um, about uh, a public space and infrastructure, in, and this prototype is in Seattle. So um, public facility is both a model and a condition. It is a model to challenge assumptions about infrastructure through the rechanneling of surplus energy and through the provision of platforms for possibility. Public facility is also the condition of being deftly public, a skill that requires a venue for practice. This project is based on a claim that public space is neither neutral nor luxurious, but challenging and necessary. Furthermore, thinking of public space as infrastructure underscores its performative dimension and provides opportunities to address local needs while engaging the full spectrum of society. So a starting point um, is to reintroduce infrastructures that have been historically expelled from the city and to reimagine their potentials. So the competition was for public space and it was totally open. We decided to look at um, the city of Seattle and how it deals with its garbage. So um, basically it utilizes two landfills, the Roosevelt Region Regional Landfill and the Columbia Ridge Landfill. And the municipal trash is um, tracked out 300 plus miles to um, over 3,475 acres of landfill. Um, so we're thinking about taking this kind of infrastructure that's outside of the city um, or a and putting it back in the city. So we're looking at this kind of locally unwanted land use um, and putting it in the city's backyard. So how can we make urban infrastructure desirable? One of the ways that we're doing it is change it, is taking away those landfills, um, or actually they're there, but we're diverting the waste and introducing a waste to energy plant. So more specifically, a waste to energy facility will collect and process the city's non-recyclable or compostable waste. Surplus energy generated by the WTE is sold back into the grid in order to finance public facility operations while, make, while excess energy is harnessed to heat the Seattle Municipal Hot Springs, a public thermal bath. So this is the electricity um, that the plant would generate based on some calculations we did of the trash that's being taken out of the city daily. And these are the hot springs that we are adding as a kind of program um, as we attenuate the process of the waste to energy plant and um, utilize some of the byproducts. So the, um, the building landscape public space um, takes place underground as well as on top of the ground. Um, so the forms of the project um, are connected to the waste transfer transformation process. 
in that they modify and attenuate its components in order to generate pockets of inhabitation. So we provide um, parking, and here you can start to see some of the uh, thermal baths that are located underground. And the surface of the project is entirely inhabitable as a kind of park. So here is um, the section of the baths. And what we do with the landscape is um, put a kind of geometric pattern and think of the landscape as productive. So certain quadrants um, are planted with um, uh, kind of carbon sinkholes, so vegetation that's specifically good at transforming carbon dioxide. Um, as well as the other sides um, we think of as kind of monochromatic facets to this geometric form. And here are some of the experiences. I mean, it's a huge structure, so we've started to um, terrace all of the sides and provide um, hills as well. And these platforms are open-ended programmatic areas where um, people can kind of gather on this large monumental form. So here you can see the mun municipal hot springs are below. And this is what they're like on the inside. And they also provide um, hot springs on the outside. So now I'm going to transition into um, a more speculative part of the talk, which is the rabbit and the pantheon. Um, and as Michael said, a lot of this work, some of it started before I went to Rome. I was in Rome between, uh, from 2011 to 2012. Um, and a lot of it continues today. Um, I'm going to start with the pantheon um, as this kind of figure in architectural discourse. Um, I'm interested in this relationship between form and program. And so when we look at the Pantheon, I, um, and I visited it many times in Rome, I think trying to understand what makes it so incredible, uh, such an incredible building, is difficult to put your finger on. I do think that one of the aspects of the Pantheon is that it's open to the elements. So this is a photo I took of rain coming into the Pantheon's oculus. And these are... Um, you know, we tend to think of the Pantheon with the sphere inside of it, um, but these are the two openings to the Pantheon viewed from kind of a strange angle. Uh, so when thinking about this Pantheon and let's say the internal geometry, uh, the building is really powerful from the inside, and I think that part of that is because, in fact, it has this sphere inside its massing. Um, and so what I did um, is think about what a sphere enables you to do um, and the operations that it allows. So a sphere, um, if this really was a sphere, then it could allow mirroring and rotation. Um, and maybe those are ways to transform the pantheon to understand it differently. So this building is symmetric along a central horizontal plane. Its massing from the outside is a cylindrical form that meets both ground and sky with a rounded terraced bowl. The inside is 43.3 meters hollow. Uh, sorry, the inside is a 43.3 meter hollow and coffered sphere. The building has no windows or doors, but one single circular oculus at the apex, apex of the building, which opens to the air. A symmetric Circular hole of the same 8.7 meter diameter as the oculus is hollowed out of the floor, opening the building up to the earth below. The building is difficult for a human to access without additional equipment or scaffolding. This building is two buildings that are co-located but not accessible to each other. The outer building is, uh, has an octostyle portico and is circular in plan. The ceiling above is a hemispherical bowl that touches down in the center of the circular plan. The ceiling is the bottom half of the second building, which is a hollow sphere that one may only access from above. This building has a concave hemispherical bowl roof with an 8.7 meter diameter drainage hole at its lowest point, which is exactly at grade. 
And this building has two covered porches and an open air space in the center. The two porches are very different in character and form. So going from this way of thinking about um, buildings and its parts and the, way, the different things that they can do with um, different configurations of their parts, I started to think about domes um, as really interesting architectural and structural units. Uh, so while in Rome, part of um, my work there was thinking about the domes of churches and thinking of them in and of themselves. So what if they're untethered from the building um, and how you would do that? So I was looking at balloon domes and what that dome, now that it's untethered from the building, might afford programmatically. Um, there are two questions that um, I think I was really thinking through as I worked on this project. And one was, how do you do it? And Part of that revealed a really interesting relationship between a drawing and a building. So um, how do you translate a dome and how do you into a balloon and how do you make a balloon dome? Um, and how do you translate some of the geometries of that dome to a balloon? So this is a diagram of the dome of um, San Carlo. And the Part of it is, again, translating the geometry um, into a kind of puffed form. And you guys probably can understand that when you seam a balloon um, and you inflate it, it tends to want to make a kind of sphere or approximate a sphere. Mm -hmm. So in order to give um, the dome actually walls that you can be enclosed by, you have to tuft it. So um, I was thinking of ways to tuft, to translate that geometry into a tufted geometry. Um, this is this is an interesting drawing, I think, because you can see it in two ways. One is as a reflected ceiling plan of San Carlos Dome, and if you drew if you drew that full scale um, on thermoplastic foil, which is basically what I use, uh, you're basically making a full scale drawing that you inflate. So the building itself or the dome is an inflation of the drawing. Um, but that would make a disc or a donut um, instead of a dome. So in order to make a dome, you really have to pattern it on the hemisphere itself or the um, kind of elliptical hemisphere, just like you would um, with a dress if you were patterning a dress on a body. So um, thinking of how to make these parts for the dome, um, and the drawing is now two-sided. It actually has two drawings, one on top of the other, and these um, tufts in the, middle, in the middle here are basically internal loops that go in tension and give the um, quilting effect and the balloon its sort of wall thickness. Now, one thing that happens when you do that is when you inflate it, um, it shrinks and it doesn't shrink in size, but because that surface area is now um, encompassing a volume, instead of being flat, the dome gets smaller by approximately 30%. Um, so then it's a strange question of uh, if you're drawing this drawing of the dome to inflate it to be a full-scale dome, you actually have to draw it larger to get it the right size once you inflate it. Um, so that's kind of convoluted, it seems. Um, but it was a really fun way of thinking about architecture and the relationships between form, um, drawing, and drawing and building. Um, and of course, for me, I think it's also really important to ask, what does it do? So when you have a balloon dome, um, it can do a lot of stuff. Uh, it can go around the city. Um, and I became very interested in the obelisks in, in Rome as well, and the way the city was even planned. So if we think about parts of the city, um, this, is, uh, this is from Gideon, um, his book Space, Time, and, and, and Architecture, and it's a drawing of um, the planning of Baroque Rome by Sixti Pope Sixtus V, and how he, the Pope basically um, identified these really prominent sites of pilgrimage and connected them into um, a network through visual axes um, and marked them with obelisks. And this on the right is um, a drawing contemporary, uh, contemporary to Pope Sixtus V um, showing the city as this network of points and the lines between them. 
So I was thinking about looking at prominent domes in Rome and um, tying them to this network of obelisks. And once the dome is free floating from the building and can kind of go anywhere, um, I started to think about tethering them to these obelisks. So now actually the um, area that a dome can operate is a, has a much larger radius than let's say the original um, covering that the dome provided. So here are some uh, visualizations from the dome and where the dome may go. And so I um, set out to do a full-scale dome, but I chose a really small one. Um, and the Tempietto is a great dome, a great building, a really interesting building. And so I decided to do a full-scale balloon Tempietto, and it's plus or minus 15% because it's, as I have already described, very hard to get the dome exactly full scale. Um, so the plus is kind of the drawing is plus 15% and then the, the dome itself ended up being sort of minus 15% full scale. Um, and this is it in my studio. Um, and it was part of an installation in an open house. Um, and that I was doing a lot of studies with balloons in the studio anyway, so there was just a lot around. So thinking about taking the dome, if it's off the building, it can be inside the building. Um, again, how do you make it? And the way I decided to make this balloon is actually slightly different from some other balloons I had done in the past, which I'll also I'll show you um, a few of them. But what I did was I wanted to think of a way of translating the geometry into a detail that seemed suitable for the material. So um, these balloons are made out of a clear thermoplastic. And um, I wanted to give, so what I used was basically white, tape in this kind of cross geometry. And this, um, here there's basically channels where I can put a rope. And so inside the dome is actually a net, a rope net that becomes the structure for the dome. And it goes, and it only finds its form when it's in tension. So there's a lot of speculation about what it would actually do. Um, so here, you see two of the crosses because there's one on each side of the, of the balloon surface. And it's on the inside face of the balloon. So here's how it inflates. And you can see that the um, rope is in, in tension. Um, but when you have a balloon dome, um, it doesn't work like a dome anymore because it's a balloon. And it has a totally different structure which probably sounds totally obvious, but wasn't entirely obvious to me um, because I thought maybe it, could be, um, maybe it could be inflated enough that it wouldn't need added support. But actually, I did have to give it some support um, and a kind of oculus ring and a base ring in order to get it open um, and usable. So this is the dome um, in the studio, and it functioned, oddly enough, as a kind of conference dome. Um, and it's small. I mean, it was really the Tempietto's dome is very, very small. And here, our table was even much larger than the dome itself. So here are some other balloons that I did um, that were before this balloon experiment in Rome. Um, this is quite a large balloon. It's about 20 feet in diameter. Um, and this was part of um, an architectural festival in Montpellier, France, that I participated in in 2011. And um, the festival is a really interesting one because basically they, um, for 10 days, the city has, acquires a number of private courtyards inside um, these old buildings, residential buildings, that they open to the public and they invite a series of architects, or actually there's a competition and a series of architects um, do an installation. So this was mine, um, and it was, I wanted to make a balloon that um, totally filled the space and really only fit being diagonal in the space. Um, and it, you could engage by touching and walking around. So this, I think, um, this informed a lot of my thinking of my Rome balloon dome, especially in terms of you know, if you trace the plan, it's, it's a donut. It's a flat donut instead of a dome and kind of the difference between projecting on a plane and projecting on a hemisphere. This is um, a short video 
that will give you a sense of how it moved. Um, it, for me, was a really ambiguous object, and the scale did a lot of that. Um, the materiality itself as well, I mean, the balloon was so large that it didn't really kind of flit about like balloons oftentimes do, but had a weird kind of wiggle and um, sway. Um, and it would almost ripple. So it wasn't actually a kinetic object. I mean, this balloon was tethered to the space, but it was, um, a, di it, it, it was a dynamic object. And as you can imagine, with um, pretty much all of the balloons that I've done in the past, uh, they are very fragile and ephemeral. And um, this one popped very <laughs> catastrophically. Um, this is another balloon that I did. This actually preceded that big balloon in Montpellier. Um, and this was a balloon I had started at the McDowell Colony. So you can start to see kind of a lineage of thought here. Um, and this was a really fun balloon. Um, I brought, I made it in New Hampshire, I brought it to Lexington and um, experimented with it indoors and outdoors um, and also experimented with its donut hole, you know, how, it, how you would even occupy this as a kind of space. And here it is um, in an installation in New Hampshire. So um, that was kind of a let's say, an arc revolving around Pantheon. And um, this one is, is a new one. A lot of this thinking started in Rome as well. Um, but some of these things um, manifested only you know, a few months ago. And this is um, about the rabbit, which is also um, a prominent figure in culture. Um, if the Pantheon was one in architectural culture and discourse, the rabbit's kind of a folkloric one. Um, and it's really called Rabbit And because um, I, I take the rabbit and um, transform it and put it with other animals to create other animals. So this, let me see if I can play this. This is a rabbit with two dispositions. There is something double about its nature from every angle other than the orthogonal elevation. This is a rabbit running and a rabbit standing simultaneously but there is something other than the mechanical about it. I'll just play that. Though a standing and a running profile reoccur in the animal as it turns, there are multiple other attitudes the animal exhibits as we see it from different angles. Balking, turning, limping, darting, bounding, a sideways shuffle. Disposition is a relative position. And so here we see the rabbit from different angles. And it's a very awkward rabbit. I mean, it's easy to think that it's turning and looking at you. Um, from the back, uh, it has this kind of gimpy side. And even when it's at its most dynamic, um, you can see there's something very strange about its feet, which are not going in the direction you think the body is going. This is a quixotic animal or a series of animals that transform as they turn. They have multiple dispositions. Sometimes legible graphic animals appear, rabbit and elephant and bird and squirrel. The unique specificity of each graphic character is projected upon the other in a form that is the logical intersection of attitudes. The nature of a Boolean cube is pertinent to the discussion, both in terms of Boolean as a kind of logical operation and um, Boolean cubes in terms of the kind of concentrated essence of animal. This is an investigation in the geometry of logic and a kind of geometry of flavor. The DNA of the animal is in the graphic profile, an icon, which is a semblance of actual animals, or a semblance of an actual animal, but abstracted into simple geometries. A graphic U becomes a flap, a trunk, an ear, a wing, an L becomes a paw, sled, ski, tray, wedge thing. Description is elusive because multiple likenesses exist. Sometimes formations seem animal-like, other times they seem mechanical or vehicular. These objects are familiar forms destabilized through logical operations, but it's not enough to describe them in terms of process, um, for as objects they themselves have an active capacity. 
So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about these animals. Uh, this creature has a bilateral symmetry along an oblique axis. It has three arms, three heads, and one foot. The heads join with the body at a point just above the animal's tail. The single flat sled foot indicates that locomotion may be difficult for this animal. This animal is not technically symmetric, but possesses a vague bilateral symmetry. Its head is long. Its head is a long wedge that terminates in a sharp chisel beak that runs along the head's entire width. The animal is long-bodied and short-legged and possesses two stump arm wings and a long tail cape. This animal is not symmetric at all, but like the previous one, has a vague bilateral symmetry with a strongly dominant side. It has two arms, two legs, and two skis. One side of the body is larger and more developed than the other. The head and the tip of the tail also have a tendency to overhang on this side, which perhaps explains the hypertrophied musculature of the dominant side. And this is the last, well, I'll maybe show you some more animals, but this is the last kind of animal I'll talk about descriptively. Um, this animal has three different and distinct characters, one for each axis. It is chimerical. Like the mythical chimera, it seems lion-like and eagle-like, winged with thick paws and a long rope tail and prominent beak. But these qualities are composite and quixotic. A raised wing from one angle becomes a head from another. A lowered wing becomes a leg. This animal is agile and shows facility in both turning and tumbling since all three axes are developed. This creature can also be described as a rabbit bird turtle, but it looks nothing like those except in plan and elevation. So this, here's a couple of images that um, I think for me seem quite chimerical in the kind of traditional mythological sense. Um, so here, I mean, I'll describe what I see. I'm quite sure you will see other things, but I see like an eagle head, the three lion paws. I see the eagle tail and a wing. Oh, sorry, a lion tail and, a wi and an eagle wing and a beak. It's hard to find the goat for me. Um, and this, I'm, this is kind of the concluding part. Um, this is some... Um, this is a project that I'm doing that obviously deals with form and shape, um, but really, I'm trying to really actively ask what are the consequences of those things. Um, and I was really lucky to be able to investigate um, the, a lot of these ideas at um, a really great conference called Possible Mediums that happened in February. And um, Kyle Miller was one of the organizers, so I'm, I'm very happy that I was invited to participate. This is um, the last video I'll show, which is um, how the animals go together um, or can go together. So animals have a way of moving in groups. Um, these ones do as well based on some of their geometry. Whoops. And so they can stack. Um, and they can also extend into arms and feet in various axes. And this was um, done with, as part of that workshop, uh, the Possible Mediums workshop. And that is the end of my talk, um, but hopefully the beginning of a longer discussion. And maybe it would make sense, before I open this up to questions, to put this on a slide sorter view. Um, Well, if anyone has a question about a specific uh, thing, maybe we can just go to that, because I have really quite a few slides in here. So I'll just leave it on, let's say, one of these critters.
Um, I found the early portion about topography, typology, and um, topology really interesting in that you were cutting across different disciplines. And obviously, one of the big buzzwords nowadays in architecture is um, us moving towards a more transdisciplinary profession. Uh, could you comment on in what ways you see your work as possibly being transdisciplinary, how you worked with other sorts of designers and uh, other professionals, and what, where you would like to see it move? Sure. Um, well, I, in the past, have worked with other kinds of designers. Um, I, I have worked on various, like, for example, one of the balloons I had done in the past. Can you guys hear me? One of the balloons I had done in the past was um, collaborative. I didn't show it, but looked at material properties um, because the metallized thermoplastic conducts electricity. So I had worked with a group called AOLAB um, in turning them into um, speakers and kind of surface wires for a larger installation that was interactive. I think um, in terms of transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary, um, or even disciplinarity, uh, I think that for me, I'm really interested in ideas and their consequences, and I don't think that ideas necessarily have boundaries. But, and that's where, for example, I think a lot, as like, for example, in some of the work I showed at the beginning of the talk, um, would go into infrastructure, whether they're kind of surface, crosswalks, very literally, or this waste to energy plant. But for example, with the waste to energy plant, there's also a concept there about the attenuation of form and kind of co-locating programs, which I think is really similar to the landscape hill project. So I think for me, the, um, the boundaries between disciplines are important because I do think that each discipline has um, a past and a discourse and it's specific. So that's why I'm also really interested in things like um, the technicalities of drawing, plans and elevations, forms of projection. Um, but the ideas, I think, are harder to put in kind of disciplinary compartments. Um, did that answer your question? I, I'm wondering about these. I'm sitting, thinking about trying to interact with the actual physical object versus the animation, and how sharp would those sort of aspect dawnings be if I was trying to, you know, walk around? I mean, they're moving pretty quickly, so it gives a real dramatic. Did you uh -huh. think about the difference between, you know, the animation and the, you know, in 3D space interacting with the made objects? Yeah, definitely. I mean, these are, I think it's really important that these are physical objects because I think the complexity of the object, while they may be understood logically very simply as a kind of Boolean operation, um, they're really strange objects. And that's also why I animated them because seeing them in still frames, I mean, that will show you something, but I think it's really your, your the dispositions are relative. So. There are two dispositions simultaneously. Well, this animal has three dispositions simultaneously. And those are the distinct animal forms of turtle, bird, and rabbit. So you can see the rabbit here in the elevation. But those things totally dissolve when you see it as an object. So the way this could be described, let's say, in terms of the discourse in elevation or plan, is very precise. But then the way they're experienced is very different. I think that. The experience of the form is a really powerful one. Um, and I think that also by choosing animal characters, things that have um, some kind of, um, I guess, personality or characteristic. I mean, personality is not really the right word. Um, but I think that those kinds of abstracted animal forms facilitate the kinds of interpretation of perception. If these were much more abstract, they would be very complex. I mean, equally as complex, but not necessarily in terms of their legibility. So um, the animations are a little bit fast. Um, it's true. Um, and I think, I think that, you know, here I can slow it down a little bit. But it, I think that they're much more, they're very exciting as physical objects. No, I didn't doubt it. I'm just trying to imagine focusing while moving anywhere near that speed, right? 
Yeah, I've been looking at them for a long time, so maybe I, I see more um, certain things. Yeah? Um, Uh, well, I think that they're, I mean, it's impossible to deny that I think as, as a designer, I do have a very specific, um, I respond very specifically to certain kinds of uh, forms or shapes, um, images, kinds of representation, null formats even. Um, and I think that I'm definitely a very active designer in that sense in all of the work. Uh, but I also really think that process is totally necessary um, because there is so much discovery in the process. So it's really, I mean, it's kind of a hard question for me to answer except to acknowledge that I think I have, um, I think that I do have a very strong and specific aesthetic um, sensibility. Um, but I think it's also very important to be able to articulate why something is interesting. And for me, that's also part of the question of like, what does it do? I mean, I'm not only interested in what does it do, but what is it? You know, that's a question of typology in a sense. And so these, let's say, have elements of like species without being fixed. Um, and they have animalness without being any specific animal, but being believable animals. Like that's very interesting to me, that kind of relationship. Um, so I think, like, what is it? How do, what does it do? How does it do it? Can it do more? All of those things I ask myself as a designer pretty frequently because I think they're all really important um, and add elements or different layers to the work. Because I think you could, I think somebody could, for example, say, hey, this is a project in form. And I think it's true that it is. but it's a little reductive to only say that it's about form. So that is, um, I do think, so I guess my answer to the question is yes, I, I think it's important to have an aesthetic sensibility as a designer, but to be able to talk about why, you know, what that is and what are the things you like or don't like, are drawn to, are interesting. I mean, I actually, I'm not saying beautiful or pleasing, though there are certainly things that I think look great, you know, um, and other things that I think look really weird. Uh, like my balloon Tempietto was kind of disappointing because it was so saggy. But that's just kind of the nature of a balloon too, especially one that has like an internal net on the inside. It's very hard to keep it fully pumped up all the time. So those are parts of the discovery as well and I think interesting aspects of aesthetics. Um, those kinds of consequences of material and form and ways of making. Sure. Sure. Well, I think that it's totally important. I mean, I'm very interested in drawing, absolutely. And I think it's a little bit tricky because the way I even talked about drawing, so let's say with the balloon dome, how I talked about that and the translation between drawing and building being a different translation than is typically done between architectural drawings and buildings because the sizes are so different. So, or, um, so I think in terms of representation, I do draw a lot. Um, and I think that part of my desire, I, it's true, I'm showing a lot of physical models and I'm, I'm showing a lot of animations, which is actually something that I haven't really done so much in the past. Um, and, I, and as formats for representation, I think that they do unique things. I think that architectural drawings 
also do things that you don't get in a model or an animation or a digital model. You know, a physical model does different things. So my process, I actually really work in all of them, and I draw first and I model. I draw and I, I, I usually draw before I model. Um, sometimes things like, instead of modeling, I'll more like mock up. So like with the balloon, a lot of that was mocking up because it wasn't about knowing what the final form was, but like finding my way toward it by testing the kinds of behaviors of the material under tension and puffed up and, and all of these things. So drawings are very, I mean, certainly very important. Um, and I, I do realize now that I think about it, um, maybe drawing is, I don't know if it's underrepresented in this presentation, but I do do a lot of drawing, so. I think that's true. I think that I think it would be very different um, because, a, like some of, so with an object, a physical object, you have that thing, and it doesn't necessarily yield its techniques. Um, but drawings can do that, and especially through certain kinds of annotated drawings or sequential drawings. So I do think that um, it is, it would be a very different, it maybe would um, afford a different kind of understanding through the different formats of communication. Um, well, I think that's a, I think that's a great question. I mean, putting together this lecture, I've knit together a narrative and a kind of, like for example, these projects didn't precede necessarily the other projects. I mean, there's no real, and even the balloon, like I started with the dome, but it actually went backwards. So it's really, I mean, I'm revisiting the work and thinking through the ideas as I figure out what it is that um, stays on as the idea is translated to different sizes different scales, different materials, different formats. So I think that, you know, the Seattle project, um, this one, and even this kind of, I mean, let's say in terms of form, because the question started with that first, I think that there's a strong relationship between the process of form making in Seattle, in this like huge infrastructural kind of landscape um, building, ob building object, um, and the animals. They have pretty different dispositions because I, the animals I talk about pretty specifically as animals, but I think they're really architectural. I think it's a very pedagogical architectural project. Um, so I think the bracketing out, I mean, of the world, I do think that I work that way pretty frequently when there's an idea that is interesting. I mean, a lot of times ideas just sound so basic. Like, for example, I mean, um, extrusions, for example, extrusions sound so basic and they also almost immediately make you think that they produce sameness all the time. Oh, this is just an extrusion, it's extruded, I see it's just an extrusion. But actually, depending on how you cut that extrusion, if it's an oblique angle, you know, you get more and more distortion in the form as you get more and more oblique. And so as you get even curved, as you, if you cut, let's say, a curved section into that, it starts to become really perturbed in its geometry. So I think I do oftentimes bracket out ideas that I see in projects 
but I do, you know, I think I work in both ways. So some of them are kind of um, experiments, thought experiments, like kind of making on its own. But um, I also do like a lot of competitions and test out these ideas um, up against the friction of program or site or scale. Um, but scales are very, I mean, I think I move these things between scales pretty aggressively as well. Obviously, there's, I mean, there's clear interest in typology and also kind of typology shape-shifting. And I, I wonder if, um, I, I know I've, I've probably seen a lot of your work, in, even in the studio, uh, developing, let's say, um, a family of typologies and a family of these shapes. Um, what you didn't really talk about, and I'm curious if, if, you, if, if, if you want to talk more about this, is the relationship between, let's say, each of the typological signatures and their performance. Because, um, because it, it strikes me that a lot of the, the typology building, of, let's say with the animals, mm -hmm. um, is a way really to create families of shapes and families that are responding to certain kind of conditions so that you build up a kind of a catalog of those mm -hmm. that create primitives that then respond to conditions as you as you see that they might actually match or not match with those conditions. I know that's at least the way some of the student work developed in, uh, in, in some studios you've done. Uh, could you say something about maybe the relationship between, let's say, typology and, and performance and the extent to which you, this work is a building up yeah. of a catalog of those kind of things or not? Um, I'll try. I, mean, I think that's a, a really good question. Um, and I, I think you have seen kind of my way of working in studio, and we've talked some about the work. I think for the building up and the typology, um, it, I think that that affords a way of understanding elements, operations, and effects that you can put together for certain things. So um, one of the, I think, uh, like, my response to an earlier question about like how I would change scale, um, I think that that is a way to test the performance of something in different contexts. So, um, like for example, there's this really amazing essay called "On Being the Right Size," and it t it's by a man named Haldane, and it was written in like the 30s. But it talks about like if humans were 10 times as big, um, just scaled up every step that they took, their legs, bones would break because the proportion of, let's say, like bone to muscle and weight, it's, it's like an exponential difference. So like surface area and strength and volume. So I think that the, um, the performance aspect, I oftentimes will try to do and with um, scales. So I'll test things at different scales. And at one scale, like let's say the scale of a room, you may be able to make a really interesting relationship um, with an object, like as kind of a, let's say, a prototypical type in a context. But then as you change the scale of it and you put it in different contexts, it may or may not do other things, and it may not do the things that you really liked about it before. So that's kind of an abstract. It may be very hard to visualize these things because I don't really have any images of it here um, in terms of the types. But I think that it is certainly true that um, I even like the kind of bracketing out of the real world or like the world into these like families of, of types. Um, I think that when I think of something as a unit or it has a kind of um, quality of being able to perform on its own, and then, I, then I'll take it out, look at it, experiment with it, and then try to do it at different scales and in different contexts. That was that just totally confusing, or um, yeah, but I do. I think that there is a lot of looking in the world and kind of analysis in surprising ways um, that gets fed back into generating these transformed types that perform 
perhaps very differently than the original kind of inspiration had performed. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out.